And now you understand it when I was explaining before how I reached a point where I was putting out so much product and had obligated myself so far out ahead in the future that I made this a bad business deal just for the sake of cash, which cost me control of the label. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Lobster Records was an independent record label based in Santa Barbara, California. It was founded by Steve Lebarski in 91, and the label started with Bad Neighbor, a Montecito-based rock band with a huge local following, featuring Alan Duncan and Mark Bennett on guitars, Sean Murphy on drums, Todd Roll on bass, and Zach Remington on lead vocals. After Lobster was over, Steve started a new label called Ort Records, which has signed bands such as Faster Faster and Nottingham. I remember learning about Lobster Records in the late 90s when Whippersnapper came through New Jersey. They were, I don't know how they got hooked up there. I think they were touring with Humble Beginnings or something like that. And I think I remember the first time I saw them was in Allendale or it might have been. Actually, I think the first time I ever saw them was they played a show at Garfield, the American Legion there. But whatever. And that's how I was introduced to Lobster Records because they were on that label. And again, later on, you know, they went to sign Yellow Card and Over It before they became bigger bands. And uh, I was just kind of like, I think in conversation, the name came up recently. And I was like, fuck, I want to learn about that whole history. So I ended up looking on Facebook and I found Steve and just messaged him. I was like, hey, dude, you know, would you like to talk about this? And he was like, I'd absolutely love to talk about it. So I got him on the Skype and this is what we talked about. Promoting concerts in college, how he got the label name, book your own fucking life not being the best resource for him, losing the label to a shit deal, focusing on artwork and top producers for the brand, some major labels not knowing how to keep a band sound, Joystick and NJ Joystick, the process of running a label, his releases being available on victorymerch.com without his knowledge, how Whippersnapper got on the label, how he plans on rebooting Lobster Records, Looking for bands outside of California when he was signing them originally, the Whippersnapper, MLB logo, and a shit ton more. Now, when you're listening to this, you're going to hear a break in the middle of the interview because he had to jump off the call at some point for some business. So we picked it back up later on, and you'll hear this about like the 55-minute marker. So when you're listening, it's just he's talking about something, which I'm not going to spoil, And then I just say, okay, we're back. So that's why it does that. So you're not just like, what the fuck just happened right there? So now you know. Be on the lookout for his book, Autumn859. So he has autumn859.com. It's the word autumn. And then the numbers 859.com. And once his book is out, you'll be able to go there to find it. So I don't know when that actually is going to happen. But I don't know. People hear these interviews either on launch day or just in the future. So if you're listening in the future, which is now the present then you should go check that out. Before we begin, I just want to have you check out a few things that I do besides the podcast. You can check out my webcomic on Instagram. It's Your Daily Bread, B-R-E-D. It's on Instagram. And I have a bunch of sketchbooks out that are available. Uh, The latest one is called Draw Some Richards. And this one's great if you own a bottle shop or a novelty store or you're looking for gifts for people. So go check that out at yourdailybread.com. Again, B-R-E-D. And I'm also an animator, so if you're looking to get an explainer video to explain what your company does in 60 seconds or less, that's what I do. If you're sick of wasting a lot of time explaining what your business does and you spent hours and hours and then times that by how many meetings you had in 2019, it would like to simplify that into a minute conversation that you can email someone without you having to be there, then email me at mike at drive80.com or check out my website drive80.com. It's drive eight zero. That's drive 80com and you can see some cool shit that I do there. If you have any suggestions for the podcast or questions or just want to say hello, you could email thiswasthescene at gmail.com. I think, I think I've think i said that a couple times, but I realize I haven't really just thrown that out there for communication. So you can email me to communicate. You can also go check out the Instagram. It's this was the scene. It's on Instagram, and you can message me that way. That's pretty much the best way I've been talking to people, but email is another avenue. I don't really communicate on twitter i just post like the teasers each week and and then launch day i'll put something up there but i twitter's just whatever i don't give a fuck and i also communicate on facebook so those are the ways you can get in touch with me and 
Cool. To help keep the podcast going, just go to thiswasthescene.com and become a Patreon for a dollar a month. It'll automatically be taken out. You don't even have to think about it. It'll just be deducted from your bank account. And that's like 12 bucks a year. So if you've enjoyed listening to all 85 episodes and want to do that, that'd be great. If you've listened to one episode and want to do that, that'd be great. If you want to donate one time, you can go to thiswasthescene.com and there's a donate button right in the top of the website and you can donate whatever you want. It could be a dollar, five dollars, fifty dollars, ten billion dollars. So just click that button and you can do that. Uh, use this PayPal, but you don't have to have a PayPal account. You can use your credit card. If you want to Venmo me, it's Mike at drive80.com. People have asked that question. So there's that. Cool. You could also buy merch on the website. And thank you for everyone who's bought merch, who's donated, who's shared this, who listens to this, who emails me, who messages me, who's left all comments and, and things like that. It's really helpful. And uh, this thing, it just keeps growing and growing. And it's, it's really fun. So thank you again to everyone who just keeps supporting this. You are fantastic. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. We started off as just focused on New Jersey, and then I branched out to all the labels and bands and studios and roadies and shit. So much uh, coming out of New Jersey, and of course, uh, you know, Lobster Records had a a band from New Jersey. Yeah, wait, which which band was that? uh, Days Like These. Just a t- terrific group. They put out uh, two albums: "Charity Burns Green" and "Inventure." What year did they? Uh, what year did you put those out? Ooh boy! Or you? Now you're gonna pin me. Two <laughs> thousands something, I think. <laughs> to sometime about in the last twenty years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe like two thousand and two thousand two. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, Where? So, uh, <clears throat> and you're out in California, started right? Started up this van over here. I don't know if you're hearing that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Yeah, All I've right. had people. I've had people stand outside in the city, like Brendan from Slapstick. He was just trying to find some some place to sit outside where it wasn't really loud. And um, I've had a bunch of people just be <laughs> walking around town. They're like hiding cars or in closet. Like Ben from Armor for Sleep was like in his closet. <laughs> like, oh my god. Well, I would have preferred to be in my, you know, in my own place. But like I say, it's a it's a dead zone, and I didn't want to risk cutting out on you. I've had I've had the conversations where I'll be talking to someone for 15 minutes and there's a noise in the background and I'll just be like, hey, what the fuck is that? They're like, oh, I've been tapping a pen or I'm walking around. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, stop that. <laughs> stop it now. Stop that. Really? Like, yeah. <laughs> a year in California, correct? Yeah, Carpinteria, California. Is that northern or southern? Uh, it's near Santa Barbara. Is that northern uh, or southern? <laughs> yeah, south south central. 70 miles out of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, miles I, used to, I used to live in the Valley about 20 years ago. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. And I literally am on the ocean, which is why I put up with the dead zone. I can imagine. I dated someone when I lived in the Valley. It was an awful, awful relationship. However, <laughs> she, her family loved Cambria. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So we used to go there a couple times. To- I've, I've been there a couple times, but we would drive through all of these ocean towns like these towns are just you know they're right on the coast and i thought Mm. like man this seems like such a great fucking life like they weren't too big and they looked like they were just like surfer towns or something and it seemed like it was kind of a great life it was i correct in thinking this this little place is definitely a throwback in time the 50s 60s 70s there's you know no major new large construction that's taken place it just is what it is and the places that haven't been built have generally been taken into the public land trust, so they're not going to be built upon. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, which is why we, all of us here, put up with whatever we have to put up with. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty you know, great. The, the prices and everything else. How far? I'm not going to talk about California the whole time, but I mean, I'll talk about the punk rock. Oh, Cambria is north of you. Yes. Okay, there it is. All right. Yeah. I remember because Ventura, Ventura is south of you, and I remember going to Warp Tour right. there. Yeah, I went to Warp Tour there one year. Me and some buddies got there. We were just like pre-gaming in the parking lot, and then we went in. I was fucking destroyed by about like two two p.m. I remember like watching face to face. I think it was on the Warp Tour compilation from two thousand 
three or something they put out and that the video they're shooting was like oh my god i was in that crowd and i lost my backpack because i was hammered and it fell <laughs> it's like oh my oh and memories you were so much younger then too yeah that was what i was 23 yeah it was 22 23 right so losing the backpack was no big deal yeah no i was like oh i just lost all the merch that i'd bought from people so that was oh, oh no that is a big deal <laughs> Sorry, so I'm going to dive into this, and uh, the way I structure it is I go back in time and talk about how you got into music, and then how you got into punk, and then we'll talk about the label and what led to that, and some cool stories, and whatever you think that you're not going to remember, you'll start to slowly have those aha moments where you're like, oh, wait a minute, there's this story. So if you have cool stories or crazy shit, that's great. If it doesn't have to be too crazy, that's totally fine as well. Okay, well, um, always have been into music ever since I, uh, you know, heard it <laughs> as a youngster. And I've always wanted to be involved with something with music. And uh, I was never talented enough to actually play an instrument and keep a beat. <laughs> so I knew if I wanted to be involved, I had to take a different direction. While I was even in high school, I uh, turned myself into a little concert promoter. And I was putting on shows through the school. Uh, for that audience of my friends and so forth, and then went to college and took over uh, my college's concert program, produced shows through there, but uh, then got out of it for a while and concentrated on having a little bit of uh, an interim career. But um, along the way, while I was doing that, I got into like a really bad accident. I was burned up in a bonfire. Oh, shit. So I lost, yeah, I lost the other business I had started, which was... Uh, I had uh, gotten a California state acupuncture license. And so I w actually had some health clinics going, but I lost them because my hands burned up and my face burned up and my chest burned up. And, you know, I couldn't deal with seeing people or touching them or anything. So I had to give that up. And uh, I passed on that whole thing to uh, some colleagues. And I went back to college for computer school. And that didn't quite work out because along the way, I uh, met a, a, a friend of mine named Mark, and Mark and I decided to start, what else, but a concert company. And I got reinvolved in doing that, and one thing led to another from the concert company. I took over managing a very popular local band in Santa Barbara called Bad Neighbor, who were just terrific. And through Bad Neighbor, I met uh, Sean Dewey, who was... Uh, the initial person who really helped me get Lobster Records going. And Sean was the guitar player in Lagwagon. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, Sean was the guitar player in Lagwagon. That was how I really, really met people. In the beginning, it was through him. But we got the name Lobster Records that I was using from another Sean, which was Sean Murphy, a uh, drummer in the band I mentioned to you before, Bad Neighbor. Yeah. And Sean was just such a funny guy, and... Um, he had like almost his own private language about things and people were either lobsters or squids. And if he liked you, you know, and you, uh, if he didn't like you and you did something stupid, you were a squid. But if he basically liked you and you did something kind of dumb, he called you a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's where I really got the name from. So go back. So you, you jumped ahead a little bit. I want to go back to just the music and you're like so you said you started doing shows in high school you started putting shows in. like what got you doing that you know who knows just boredom no it was what i really wanted to do was this in like the auditorium was this in like the like the theater like because i remember at my school we'd have a thing called a coffee house and it was a talent show oh, it's not a coffee house it was not a talent show these were like big shows with thousands of tickets sold to auditoriums Holy shit. Oh, yeah. So we jumped in jumped in big time. And uh, this was, I grew up in New York State, so this was back back East Coast. Like, were these punk bands or just like any, like, these are just bands? Oh, no, that... no, 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 no. Like, I'm like 10 years older than most of the people you probably know. Like, I'm about Social Security almost. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this was back in the late 60s, early uh, 70s. So there were no real... Punk bands is way before Sex Pistols were even thought of. So we were doing, you know, hippie shows. Did you have like a like a love for music or did you just like have a love for just the business side? Well, absolutely. At that time, you know, it's the golden age of rock and roll. 
And that time in music, just as you know, uh, screwed with so many people's heads because it was so wonderful and so miraculous where almost on a daily basis, a brand new sound was coming out and a brand new perspective was uh, being presented to people. You know, and a lot of us fell under that spell. So you graduated from high school and went to college and just kept doing the shows. And then, so I'm reading on here on Wikipedia that you founded Lobster Records in 91. Uh, yeah, that would be when I first started working with Bad Neighbor. And uh, I picked up, of course, that name from Sean, the drummer in Bad Neighbor. And the first project we did was just putting out a little 45 RPM for that band. On You know, it said Lobster Records on there, but it wasn't uh, distributed except by me passing out copies <laughs> so what made you want to like start a label like how'd you go from promoting to just being hey like i, I want to just oh put music uh, i uh, finally after like working and working and working and working i got um bad neighbor like uh you know the biggest gig we had up to that moment santa barbara has its own little private holiday called fiesta and we were starring at the biggest club and the biggest night of fiesta it was going to be a sellout we were finally going to get paid a decent amount of money. And the night before the show, uh, one of Sean's friends took him and fed him a bunch of alcohol and mescaline and put him on a plane to Las Vegas. Oh, God. <laughs> so I got a call the next morning of the show from Sean in Las Vegas. His voice just as rasped out as a, you know, 400 cigarettes could ever make it. Right. <laughs> and he's like, Toro. Because he used to call me El Toro. That was my nickname. He's like, Toro, I can't make it. <laughs> oh, and I was just so angry. We had to cancel the show. Back out, it was nothing but fiasco. I was really angry and upset at the whole thing. I said to myself, he said, you know, I'm not going to quit working with music, but I never want to be subjected to just one band or one guy ruining my life again. <laughs> to try to work with a few different bands <laughs> so that if one of them goes cuckoo, I at least got somewhere else, you know, to put my energy. And that was really why I decided to uh, kind of get the label going to have like a little more, uh, a few different things to fall back on in case something else exploded. So how did you get, how did you get connected with Sean from Lagwagon? Sean's the, the really, the, the super tall guy, the guitar player, right? No, no, no. That's Chris Flippin. Okay, okay, okay. Is Sean still in Lagwagon? Uh, no, he's not. But uh, so Sean uh, came over from Lagwagon. He had his own group called Buck Wild. That uh, Chris Flippin was actually in. It was Sean's side project from Lagwagon. Sean came over because uh, I had an office and I had my little record company office in a musician's building where there were a lot of practice studios. So I met him because he was around practicing. We decided that it would be a good idea for Lobster Records because I had like some uh, a little bit of cash to put out and finance the Buck Wild album, the, his side project for Lagwagon, you know, and God, uh, God bless him, he got us distributed by Fat Records with Fat Mike. And that was really a, a good start. And then Fat helped, uh, helped me out by giving me lists of distributors, which we went on to then, you know, make our own deals with. And this was all around, this is all in 91? No, no, this was, it was the mid nineties, let's say 90, uh, uh, three, four, five, what I'm talking about right now. 96, we were really putting out other artists in addition to Sean's band. What led you going down the direction of like the, the what's what, like staying with like the punk style? Um, Sean had a lot, a lot to, to do with that, to opening, you know, my eyes to that part of the scene. And then we had, uh, Another friend in town here named Tim Gates, who was uh, the leader of a band, a terrific band called Jargon, uh, J-A-R-G-O-N, Jargon, that we put out uh, one release for. And Tim was like the first person introduced me uh, sort of to the more emo side of things. Before emo was even a word, practically the guy that invented the word <laughs> back then. And so uh, he like opened my eyes to that side of things. So Lobster is always a, that kind of walked that line. Yeah, the bands were, were, were punk, but they were, you know, punk with something else on them too. So what do you mean? Listen to, to, to you know, uh, a, a Park and uh, some of the other bands. I mean, they're, they're crying in there and ringing it out. It's not just about necessarily uh, righteous protest. 
you know, good protest, but it's also about, the, you know, the feelings that drive us to protest. Like, were you involved in the scene? Like, were you, you know, when he got you involved in these, these like, these bands and stuff, were you going to shows and just kind of, like, seeing? Oh, just... absolutely. I was still, I produced, uh, I was, when I was doing the managing of Bad Neighbor, I was also putting on concerts during that period at the same time. Now, when we really uh, started the label, I had to transition that a little bit because the bands came from all over the United States and I couldn't really be a, a booking agency. So I transitioned into, you know, providing tour support for them. So how did that, wait, so when you did tour support, what did that mean? Like, what did you do? Helping them find real booking agents. Cause that, that is a whole separate profession at some point. You know, if you really are, are a professional band, professional artist, you need someone who, whose business it is just to book tours. I was rather involved running the label. Right. More than having time enough to book tours. It was, you know, hard enough doing what I was doing. Now, at this time, too, I think, uh, was this around the time that Book Your Own Fucking Life was out through Maximum Rock and Roll? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was that one of the things that helped you, like, do that with bands? Because everyone has contributed their tours and their ability to go on the road because of that. Was that something that you found to be, you know, a useful tool back no, then? I, no. Um, you know, that's a great resource for people, but, you know, as a young artist coming up, you want to keep uh, getting on better and better shows, larger venues in front of uh, bigger audiences with more well-known bands. Okay, so Book Your Own Fucking Life was really just how to get into a local show. Like, they didn't help you find bigger venues or, or things like that? Uh, no, not not really, not really. The best thing was always knowing the other bands. Oh. <laughs> Going out and going out with somebody that already had an audience, because if nobody knows you, why would anybody necessarily come to your concert? That's so funny. I don't think I've ever touched on that because so many bands, when they started, they were booking it themselves, you know, book your own fucking life. And I never realized that that was just, you know, it was just an entry point for them playing at, at just anywhere out of state. It wasn't like, yeah, this will get you in some giant club somewhere. And that, that just took time. Because like you said, like that's when they met other bands and labels and that's and booking agents through the grind. That's right, Mike. Oh, that's so funny. And just... course, you know, b bands are human beings and uh, bands fall in love with other bands. So there's always uh, comes a, a point on the road where you meet another artist that you really like. And, and if you're lucky and they're actually somebody big and they really like you, you know, you got it made. They'll introduce you to their booking agent. Well, how did you build relationships then for booking bands that you were in California? Well, of course, I had Santa Barbara covered. I could always do my own local uh, scene, but really, that was a, a difficult part of it. And the bands had to work hard for it and earn it themselves. You know, there's it was only like a, a limited amount of stuff I could really do with a label the size of Lobster Records. That would be providing the tour support. In other words, making sure people ate and had gas and had a vehicle and had uh, posters and albums and all the things, the shirts and whatever to uh, go along with being on the road. Yeah. But being on the road to attract the, you know, the attention and retain a booking agent, the band needs to make their own relationship with that person. So I want to break that down because I, I've been working for myself for... God, like 13 years, I guess. And I'm fascinated by business. So I really want to, and so I like, I, I, so I, growing a business, I'm fascinated at how people do it, especially from a small business. And then it could grow to be gigantic. But starting from like this, the beginning, there's always a huge learning curve of just, I don't know how to do this shit. Like when you started the label and, you know, because you went from booking shows and then you're putting out records, what was like the, the biggest learning curve at the very beginning? Oh, uh, great question, Mike. Um, figuring out what a record label actually is and how it's supposed to uh, function and operate as a business, that was the, the learning curve. Everything else with it came pretty naturally, you know. I understood about the need to provide proper artwork and uh, proper advertising and promotional support for people. That part was easy because that translated out from... Uh, doing the concerts and doing the concert promotions. I mean, you know, remember we were making vinyls, so I had to figure out how to really make vinyls and 
uh, really make compact discs. The production part of it was a learning curve because you have to submit, you know, proper uh, artwork and proper formats of stuff. You know, uh, actually making the albums correctly. That was a, a, a bit of a learning curve, too. But fortunately for people, I really had the idea of making albums correctly. And what that means, you know, at least in my mind and at least for starter bands is hiring a good producer for the album, somebody that really knows their way around a studio, you know, and not just letting necessarily people run off by themselves, but having, you know, a focus. Because if you notice, and at least for me, you know, if you've ever looked at any of your favorite, favorite pieces of music, they're generally not produced by the band and not mastered by the band. Yeah, I felt like in the 2000s, even though obviously this is focused on like the late 90s stuff, but I felt like music producers kind of became the rock stars in the 2000s because everyone would just hear of their names and that actually got people to buy an album. It was as they were like, oh, Steve Evitz or like Mark Trombino or who's the guy who did like all the metal bands? He's like, cre- I forget his name. He did like At The Drive-In's last record or did Relationship Command. Um Darn if I can remember. Fuck, but uh, Trombino produced uh, uh, Mock Orange, the record play for Lost Records. So that's what I would do. So I had the idea even back in the day of getting Mark Trombino or Cameron Webb or uh, Darian Rundle or someone to come all along and take care of the production of uh, the product for the, for, for, for the bands. And then also to, not, uh, to take everybody over to the Capitol Tower down in Hollywood and get out stuff mastered by Capitol straight on with us sitting in at the mastering session so it'd be done perfectly and that had a lot to do with the success of the label is making sure everything was sonically correct absolutely you know a lot of attention was paid to that it sounds like you were very quality focused absolutely quality focused all the time that was the only way we were going to ever 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 make it in my mind or i would ever 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 want to put in that much time and money was there a certain reason for that though for the focus on the quality was just, I mean, it was just the way I knew to do things right. And, you know, I always also had the idea that if you wanted to, you know, ever look back in time and be proud of something, we wanted to do it right. So that even today, when I go back and listen to this music, I'm still motivated by it. You know, and not to dwell on it too too long, but what really, you know, I'll give it to you in a couple of sentences, what really happened to Lobster, if I, if I can without names and it's you know uh really on me but we we reached a time where we were really steaming along i mean really but i had a, like a lot of outstanding financial obligations and uh, to meet the obligations in other words to pay my staff and to pay production and to you know get out on the road or blah 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 i signed a business deal i shouldn't have signed and i lost control of my label and that's why Lobster kind of disappeared, because when it finally dawned on me what a terrible thing I had done to myself after all of that work and putting everything together, I just went into a kind of a deep depression. And I dissociated for a long time about everything because I felt that I had let a bunch of people down, including myself. You know, long period of uh, drug and alcohol over abuse and then had to right the ship after that my, of my own personal life. And uh, what I did to heal uh, during that time was I wrote a, a, a terrific novel, an action adventure story that uh, I can tell you about at some point in time. But uh, now it's really interesting that you called me because I have been a little bit active in trying to revive things for Lobster Records. And I have just... Uh, concluded an arrangement a couple of weeks ago with the original artist who would draw my, uh, the little lobsters that we had yeah. uh, to create some more art for me that I can then, uh, I'm going to redo the website and blah, 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 and at least put up some merch for folks to buy. Interesting. Yeah, and then maybe look, not necessarily for a band or two uh, for for me to manage, because, uh, you know, as I said, I'm just... Uh, you know, a little bit older, and I don't necessarily want to run around on the road, but I wouldn't mind finding, you know, uh, some younger, you know, people to support and let them go. Yeah, so it's going to be funny because, you know, you had mentioned before that, you know, when you first started this out, you're putting out vinyl, because seven inches were huge, and then CDs came out, and like nowadays it's all digital. 
So that's like a whole different thing. Because back then people were buying things and now they're just downloading shit or listening to Spotify. So I do want to jump back and talk more about like the history of the label. But like for now, like, do you find that that's going to be a bit of a a barrier or do you, is that why like the t-shirt thing and like the merch thing uh, is going to be so big with you kind of reviving this? Well, it's going to, no, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Let's not say a barrier. It's just a new environment uh, to deal with. Uh, but I think the the basic elements of making music and making records remain, you know, of getting the production values right and making sure you have a core uh, piece that really represents the artist correctly. Do you have any producers that you are you're connected with that are still doing it? Cameron Webb is still doing it. So he's there. I don't know what Trombino's up to these days. I'd like to find out. He is a great guy. Yeah, he uh, his name he was so big. I think the thing that got him on my radar was when he did, I think it was Clarity. I think when he worked with Jimmy World, or he worked with them in Static Reveals, and I think with Clarity. He he came out of like uh, Drive Like Jehu, right? Or yeah, something like that. I think he was the drummer, but maybe. Yeah, that was a great band, and and Fishwife, all those bands back then, the San Diego bands. Well, it's funny, like when I heard about Drive Like Jehu, this is around the time where I was listening to Emo and Pop Punk and they were pretty harder and I liked harder stuff, but they were like this. Oh, they were great. Yeah, I just, I I think I'd have to listen to them now. I'd probably have to listen to them now to, to give another chance. But like back then, I remember they had the album where it was like an ink dropper on the cover or something. And I listened to it and I was like, I just can't get into this and i really wanted to <laughs> yeah it, it, it's hard it's it, it's hard but it's worth it it's worth it it's like it's like getting into beer and someone's like try is you know you're trying lager someone gives you like an ipa and you're like whoa that was a bit too much <laughs> that was a step up from what i'm used to mike you were so right i haven't thought about a lot of this stuff in a long time it's kind of like floating in the back of my brain good <laughs> that's that's yeah awesome. that is that is that is good that is good um, so being influenced, you know, Fugazi, Sonic Youth, all those kind of bands that I really loved, try to bring that sort of sense, you know, that sort of uh, intellectual sense to the label, too. When you started the label, did you have any kind of vision that you wanted to follow? Oh, well, sure. Just wanted to be the world's best record company. Really? <laughs> Nothing more than that. <laughs> you that, like focus you know in our in our field i mean not like in country music or jazz but you know in our little corner of the rock world interesting i feel like that's kind of a very i I love the ambition of that and do you feel like that's like do you have a kind of a perfectionist style um it it might be a mild case of ocd (laughs) (laughs) well it just kind of makes sense because if you're saying that and that was your focus and you're being serious and you know you're talking about artwork and production I mean, those are things that when I've talked to a lot of labels, they were like, yeah, we found an, someone who's a graphic designer and they kind of threw this together. But it sounds like you might have been a person that when you were working with the designer, you were like, tweak it, tweak it to like you really getting it down and then working with like producers. It's also about making sure it's polished and then everything else. It seems like there's a very polished attitude to to kind of go with what you're saying, like you want to be the biggest record label. Yeah, and I wanted to make albums, you know, I always figured that we were finding uh, relatively obscure bands trying to, you know, elevate their game, and, and, and uh, you know, I never necessarily figured that Lobster Records would be anyone's uh, permanent home, because what happens is, uh, if you really get going, you always get approached by the the major labels who are able to do so much more for you and offer an artist so much more money and so much more support than Lobster Records ever could. And that's why most bands migrate, you know, forward from their from their little label. The deals that we would sign would basically be like uh, three album deals. But if somebody met a, a major label along the way that needed to get going, I would let them I would let them go because the idea for us as a startup label would be that um, if you got successful on the major label, people would come back and check out your previous work. Mm. Yeah. So how oh. whatever we were able to do on our own was great, but I always made wanted to have the art and the everything up, 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 so that if you know the band, as in the case of Yellow Card, really caught traction, yeah, that when people came back, there would be something worth coming back to. That's so smart. I never 
that I've never even thought about it that as well. It's having that that vision of okay, I know that if you do leave, they that your newer fans, you're gonna have a bigger fan base. If you're on a major, you're gonna get more eyes regardless. A- absolutely. And that same fan base is gonna come back to us, and where you guys are still making, you still own the first couple records, so you're still making that money off of that. So, which so besides yellow card, because I know over it got pretty big, didn't they? Yeah, over it went on to become a Virgin label band. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, over so, it, over it became pretty pretty big for a while. They changed up their style of music slightly along the way. You know that I think caused a couple of questions among the the, the hardcore fan base. Well, don't you think that kind of happens though when there was like that major label? I don't know what it would be called, but like when bands would go on a major label they would their sound would change because they had too many voices in their ears or too many eyes on what they were doing yeah being like, and that's and that's always the dan- the danger point you gotta you gotta make it through that and and uh, you know yellow card was uh, lucky they found neil avron who just put out a great uh, ocean avenue which is a great sounding album uh for them so they got through it over it um met someone who didn't uh, quite 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 get the style did that kind of bum you out though when you saw that yeah, a lot. Did you like ever? <laughs> did you ever have a conversation with them after? You've been like, "Hey, uh, what the fuck happened?" <laughs> um, actually, Mike, not not really, and I would actually like to have that. Do you still have a, like? Do you still have like open communication with like these bands? I mean, not telling you to just go do that, uh, but I'm uh, just saying in general. Uh, yeah, I talked to uh, 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 Park. Just last week, I'm, I'm working on a couple of things with them uh, to help them out online with sorting out some of the catalog issues. Uh, Mark Orange actually made it to California last year, and certainly I went and saw them perform, you know, and hung out with them. It was so much fun. That's awesome. Yeah, to this very day, it's one of my most vivid memories. It was like that much fun to see them again. When I lost the, the, the label, you know, and kind of like I told you, I kind of got lost for a while. I really repressed like a ton of stuff because it hurt that badly. Yeah, I've I've talked to a bunch of people like uh, you know, it's been 20 years and that's usually where the focus is and it's funny cuz yeah. I for some reason I think I might just mentally be living back then and not living so I mean I try to be as present as much as possible with like the things I'm doing but I think there is something about that error that keeps me that I keep around because it's invigorating and it's I it's exciting to me and a lot of people they had kind of a, a bad thing happen or something shitty happened where they're like i don't want to remember this anymore so they'll just block off stuff and so by talking yeah. about this it almost like you said it just chips away and just these little closet doors open up and it's like holy shit there was this there was this like nothing could be he- healthier mike nothing really could be healthier yeah than processing all this crap and i told you i was trying to start out with some new merch too so this is just cleaning me out you know, from the inside, for getting refocused on things. That's awesome. This is a free, uh, free, free therapy session. <laughs> yeah, it, it really, it really is, and of the best kind. That's awesome. What was like? Yeah. But like, what are what are some of the things? What are some of the things that are like coming up? Like memories that you have that are like popping up. <laughs> well. <laughs> Um, here we go. <laughs> focus me here, Mike. Focus. There are a million of them. Well, like something, you know, maybe we could focus around. I mean, you I know, want... Warper recording studios, uh, the staff at Lobster Records, of course, was terrific. Well, let's talk uh, about I that. The... Like, I want to talk about the staff. Like, you know, how many employees do you have and what did the office setting look like with like the day to day with them? There was one big open room. And uh, desks shoved against the walls, computers on the desks. Uh, one desk was mine. Uh, one desk belonged to Zach Gershon, who was uh, my assistant. Uh, yeah, we had Kelly Morgan there in, in, in publicity. There were a bunch of different people that worked down there. Jessica uh, uh, worked down there, Jessica Sonquist. And uh, Zach really helped me out after, sh- after uh, well, I started out working with Sean uh, Dewey there, as I told you. Yep. And then Sean moved on to concentrate on really uh, making Buck Wild something. And so he did He did good doing that. And I went on and hired a staff, and I got Michael Johansson, who I met, um, because he, he admired what Buck Wild was doing. And he came on and started doing the graphics at Lobster Records. 
but um, he didn't really have a desk at the office. He mainly worked out at, uh, from his house. So, it, so you actually had a, a full-time employee who did the design work? Yes. Oh. That was another thing I, I invested in. That's why things came out looking fairly decently and all the uh, advertising and different things that we put out were uh, somewhat consistent and art-centric. And that was one of the attractions uh, for the bands, too, to sign on to the label. They could have their own graphic artists that they could call up and deal with and, you know, approve and give ideas to on their own. That's smart. Yeah. So Michael was paid as a, a, a full-time employee. It was pretty, you know, pretty expensive investment for the, you know, money we put into paying Michael, which was totally worth it. But, you know, he, he could have put out a couple of albums, I'm sure. And so the budget for, you know, a lobster production was basically it was about 50000 to get through one. Wow. So that was for recording, artwork, collateral and all things like that? And the first uh, maybe uh, ten thousand, five to ten thousand compact discs. Jesus Christ! Did you like? Was this all money that you were? Were you raising this, or did you just all out of pocket? Yeah, I, I had I had money that I had made on my own doing other things, so I out of pocketed it. God damn. That's gonna be that's gonna be insane. Like when you put out the first couple of releases, I mean, I'm guessing it wasn't you weren't spending that much money on those. That's right. That's okay. right. That's right. It built up to that. Okay. It's like, God damn. <laughs> and, and, you know, the first, the first ones, of course, because I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was putting my toe in the water, you know, more gradually and gradually. But once I made the decision to go on, I wanted to go on in the proper fashion. I love that. I, I just, I, I, again, I'm, I'm so fascinated by this because I live in a, in, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina now, and obviously from Jersey, but I'm in this startup space where I'm just surrounded by these companies that are doing this and, but they're getting all these VCs and these things like that, but they're not starting small. Like they're getting millions of dollars to put out this idea. And I'm just watching them try to grow these companies. And some of them are like bombing and some of them are actually exploding. And it's just interesting to see that ha be, you know, happening back in the nineties where it's, it's always the same structure, but it's just like something it's a different product that's being put out. But I mean, the stuff they're putting out now, obviously it's, it's an app. They're like, there's no, there's no like passion for it. There's like, I just make some fucking app, but with music, I think it's cool. And it's, it's, it's exciting to me and interesting to see and hear about like how that was grown back then. But also at the same time, like you're putting out fucking music. Like that's so awesome. It, it really, it really is. And you're dealing with musicians who are the most independent lot of people you could possibly imagine. So just the fact of trying to coordinate everybody towards a common goal. Oh yeah. It really is success. Well, I've talked about this so many times, like a business, uh, bands are basically a business partnership and none of them ever have that conversation in the first mm -hmm. place of where they're visual, like where they want to go. Are they all on the same page? And then they're also creating you know, art, which is, has a, an emotional tie to it. So when you're sitting there in the studio telling them to change something, there's, if they're open to it, then that's good, but if they're not, then that's a really, that causes a lot of drama well, and that's, explosion. You see, Mike, you hit it. And that's why you hire Mark Trombino, because they're not going to change anything for me. Yeah. But if Mark Trombino suggests that you change something, you know, at least you'll think about it. It's almost like couples. It's like if you're if you're with some, you're dating someone, and you tell them that you that they should change something, they're not gonna listen. But if someone around, like their friend, mentions it, <laughs> like yep, they listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Now, but but of course, since since I was paying Mark Trombino, I could at least talk to Mark. Yeah. Because he didn't work for free. He'd, uh, he'd have to get his check from me. So if, I, so if I had something to say, that was when I had my say. <laughs> yeah, you're like, hey, just don't tell the guys or, or don't tell the band that that was me. He'd be like, that's fine. Don't worry about this. I got it. I still want to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a band from Jersey called Joystick. And I remember at one point they changed it to NJ Joystick because you guys had a band label called Joystick. Was that a thing like, I think if I'm remembering this, the way I'm remembering it is that the one from Jersey got either they found out about Joystick existing, so they changed it to NJ Joystick, or they got contacted by them to change it. Do you know anything about this? This is so minuscule and weird. If yeah, it's, no, it's coming back. It's coming back to me. I remember about NJ Joystick. I just am not really 
quite remembering the backstory of how it, it happened. We put out a joystick maybe in 1996. Yeah, it was about the same time as these guys. Yeah, so maybe it was just a question of who got to first base first or something like that. Yeah, because I was in a band called Lane Meyer, and we found out there was these guys in Seattle called Lane Meyer. I think we emailed them. This is also, we were like really just fucking uh, sensitive guys, and we were like, hey, change your fucking name. <laughs> right, I kind of remember a couple of those emails. Yeah. That is funny. It's kind of coming back now. What was like the first release that you did where it took off and you were like, holy shit, that, I did not expect that? Well, it was actually the first uh, Buck Wild release, Beat Me Silly, which was distributed by Fat. And the fact of Fat, who actually reordered some copies, floored me. So in the first pressing of that, though, how many did you do? Oh, back then, Josh. Like a thousand? Uh, geez, Mike, maybe, um, yeah, 2,000. I'm trying to I'm trying to think back. I think um I think that they asked for 3000. The second that, time that or the was, that was time? the deal my, the first time Mike wanted 3000 because back then that was the way of distributing music and 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 Fat Mike with Fat Records had that many stores and that much going on. I mean, it was an okay number. Of course, Mike, if you understand the record business, I mean, you have to take returns. Just cuz you send somebody 3000 copies of whatever doesn't mean they owe you for those 3,000 copies. Oh. Because those 3,000 copies then have to be distributed. They have to sell. And then the, the, the person who actually sold them has to get paid by the distributor, which is another whole ball of wax. So you may not really see very much money on those copies coming back. Wait, so you would send... So he wanted... he So a record label... So distributor like Fat, he'd be like, okay, I want 3,000 copies. And you'd send yeah. it to him, but he wouldn't give you a check for that? No. No shit. No, because... Well, well, he has to uh, sell them. So it was like consignment, basically. Yeah, it's complete consignment with a, you know, a return reserve. Like they even uh, they hold back some of your pay to offset future returns so that they don't get left holding the bag by you. Nobody will ever pay up front in full. Wow. Okay, so you would send that to a distributor. They'd send it to stores. The stores would sell it, hopefully give that money to the distributor, and then the distributor would hopefully send you a check like within a couple months or a year? <laughs> year? Hopefully within a year. No shit. So you got to be prepared to hold on for a while with the... You know, no income where the only income you can generate would be by selling label merchandise or band T-shirts if you have a deal with the band. So that was the way that you'd be able to sustain up front. Yeah. That's interesting. Or just live on top ramen. Well, it's funny because, like, I'm a, I do freelance work and I do, like, graphic design and animation and stuff. And, I mean, I've had people come to me and they're like – yeah, we'll pay you a net 90. I'm like, get fucked. <laughs> like, there's no way I can wait that long to get paid. I'm like, you pay me as soon as I'm done with the project, you pay me, you get the files. I'm like, I'm not I'm not a big fucking business where I, I have like net 90 from 90 days ago where there's like thousands of dollars coming my way. Yeah, of course. Of course. As a small business person, you need to be paid when you do your work. Yeah, absolutely. Man, that's crazy. So basically, like, you start in the label, you're putting this out, you're, you're, these releases are, you know, finally selling, but now as you're putting the new ones out, you're, what's keeping you afloat is all those back releases you put out, that they're, that money's finally coming in, and then you got to wait for this current batch to catch up later on. So it was just, you're living off of something you did, like, six months ago or a year that's ago. That's right, and now you understand it when I was explaining before how I reached a point where I was putting out so much product and had obligated myself so far out ahead in the future that I made this a uh, bad business deal just for the sake of cash, which cost me control of the label. So I see that I can get Lobster Records merchandise on VictoryMerch.com. Is this really? Company? Yeah. I don't know what what are they offering there. Uh. So if I go to Victory dot com merch label lobster records it's got yellow card park mock orange lorraine drive small victory so oh, I I, some t-shirts 
Let me, actually, if I click on it, it's uh, it's a CD. You can buy a CD. Okay, so um, that's interesting. Uh, which park CDs are available there? It's, it's interesting. Like I was talking to Adam in his package, and he, I was like, "Yeah, your stuff's on eBay." He's like, "Really?" I'm like, "Wow!" I'm like, in real time, people are finding this shit out. Uh, park building a better under, you know, just blank. It won't snow where you're going. No signal. Those are the three. Well, I at some point back in the past, I had Chip Victory some uh, copies. Of them, uh, Victory has never uh, offered uh, sales reports or compensation or explanation. They just ran with uh, a lot of the stuff. Hmm. Um, Victory isn't even owned by Victory anymore, by the person who used to own it. Tony? Yeah. Oh, he sold it, or he did he get like screwed over? Yeah, he just recently sold it. He picked up $30 million from... Uh, Oh, I forget who the company was, but supposedly he's out and just doing real estate. Holy shit. According to the publicity, he kept his staff and just moved him on to his apartment investments and whatever he's doing. Wow. So was the... But Victory found out, I mean, they found out what everybody else kind of knows today. Without really getting the, the good bands that kids stream, you're lost. All you right. can do is sell t-shirts. So he shouldn't, he was never authorized to do any of that i imagine some of those copies i don't know where they're obtaining them from they might even be bootlegs i can't even imagine what it is but all that stuff is going to come back up on the lobster record site so uh, so were you able to because if you're going to reboot like if i'm using that term right like reboot the label or is it never it like just kind of went away because you didn't put things out or Correct. okay now you like I've always kept like the domain and like the oh, yeah. LLC and all that stuff. So that's that's just been there. So now like to restart it. Um, what so what actually got you wanting to do that? When Lobster Records ran into trouble, my alter, alternate strategy was I formed another uh, label called Urt Records. Yeah, I see that. O, -O, -O R T. So that was the genesis of Wirt Records. And uh, just recently, I've been talking to one of the uh, artists that have been on Wirt Records. As a matter of fact, I'm going to try to call him a little later today about some projects that they were doing. And that kind of got me all re-stimulated. So, In what way? It is, uh, it, well, talking to the band, which is TGL, they've done just terrific on their own. They actually uh, got a hold of their uh, master uh, recording from back in the day and uh, redid it in, in, in the right way. I mean, I totally agree with what they've done because it, it really needed something, you know, a mix that it didn't have at first. Very happy with what they've done all the way around. And, um, you know, we're trying to get uh, started with getting some vinyls out for them now that everything is so uh, happening. So that kind of brought all this stuff up. And I mentioned to you about uh, writing that uh, book that I told you about, which took forever to write. Well, I finally finished it. So I sort of have, you know, a little bit more clear vision in terms of time and what's open in front of me. How long take you to write the book? Oh, uh, 10 years, at least. I've written it eight different times. And it's long. It's like it's like Lord of the Rings. It's I mean, it's long. Was this something that when you started it, was this kind of uh, like around the time? Like how long ago did you did Lobster basically stop? Like have a hard stop? Uh, two thousand nine. So basically, like ten years ago. Yeah. Right. Two thousand nine. Two thousand. Two thousand. You know, six. It was already getting bumpy with me refusing to admit it. Like, was that also, but 2006, like, when did Yellow Card break? Oh, uh, probably 2003. Yeah, that was their LP that really broke through. When that broke, and then, you know, them and Over It are, like, signing these bigger labels, you know, that, it, then again, like you said, that attention's coming back to you from their newer fan base or bigger fan base to, to get all the old stuff. So, I mean, I figured, like, that would probably have been, like, a nice boost 
from 2003 to 2006. Oh, it absolutely was, Mike, which was why the people were interested in doing these other uh, business deals with me. The fact that the deals went wrong, I chose the wrong uh, people to do the deals with. Right. You know, and that part I'll take on me because, uh, you know, needed cash to go ahead and keep the productions rolling. But, uh, there, you know, there you go. To do, and I, I've asked this before to other labels, like around this time, though, um, because Napster was in the late 90s. And yeah, five Napster. Now, did you, okay, so like when that was coming around, though, did you catch wind and go, oh, this is going to be bad news? No, well, it was bad news. I mean, he was stealing artists. If it's hard for artists to get paid, he made it impossible. You know, it's difficult enough to get paid as an artist. It really is, unless you're the, the world's biggest artist. You know, and you have a lawyer and a manager and an agent and everything else, it's hard to get paid. Yeah, I don't understand how bands even, I mean, no bands were making it back then if they were smaller bands, but I don't understand how, when I see, there's a couple of venues in town and I see these, these vans roll up with these bands, I'm thinking like, how do any of you expect to make any money nowadays? Like even like the semi bigger bands, I'm like I don't even understand how you guys are like getting yeah, paid. Well, the money's the money's in the touring nowadays. The real cash is in the touring because uh, you know ticket prices for major artists touring has gone through the the roof. Yeah. So that's where they expect to uh, make their money. And of course, if you really do have a lot of streams, you're going to make money. You really will. How many streams do you need to make? Because I have a buddy. He put out a record, and I think he had like. I mean, I if, I'm, I could be remembering this wrong, but I think he said like 60,000 streams or something, and he made like six bucks. Like, how many streams do you really need where you can actually make some cash? Uh, multi-millions. You have to have a quarter million fans who are each willing to listen 25 times. It's kind of like YouTube. If you have a video play like 30 million times, you can actually get like, I think it's like 30 grand or something stupid like that, just for people watching your video. Mm-hmm. God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I mean, that, that's completely appropriate because otherwise, why watch YouTube? Right. Exactly. I mean, that's the content and they should pay content providers. So real quick, we so my old band, we went on one of our tours was with Whippersnapper. Yay. And oh, yeah, yeah, I love those guys. That's where I remember the band name from. Oh, my God. Whippersnapper. So good. How did you find those guys? And like what? Yeah. What got oh, them on your demo. Radar? Okay. Just through, through demo that came to the office. That was one of the great things that I was able to do was we would actually listen to every demo that showed up. I gave, I would give everyone the time of day of going through their record and, or their uh, submission and definitely write back to them. We had a, a nice form letter that I would send out, but I would always write something personal on the form letter and thank them. And then, you know, once in a while, once every thousand listens that you do, somebody actually catches your ear. You know, and you think to yourself, hey, this might work. And then Contact, you call you call up the band and find out, you know, try to find out a little bit about their situation. Uh, are you was there anything about them, though? Like, I know you're about to probably say what I'm going to ask, but was there something about a band that you'd have to have to qualify them? Like, because you were about to say, are you like, I'm going to try to fill in the blanks. Like, are you touring? Do you guys get along? Are you still planning on being a band for a while? Like, yeah, uh, the people would send submissions and then uh, there would always be a phone number associated with it. And I would call the phone number if I wanted further information. And those would be some of the initial conversations. Um, especially, do you have a van? Are you capable of touring? <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, what's your practice in a situation? Who else do you know? on and on try to figure things out that's really smart i didn't even think about that do you have a van do you know any other bands that's so genius god i love these interviews it's like there's little nuances that just make it like fuck i never would have thought i'm i just never thought that that was the thing that was going on or those that would be the questions when i met lorraine drive the first thing i had to do for them is buy them a van yeah, that's gonna the, the expenses that you must have had, and I want to talk about Whippersnap or so, but like the expenses that would come up, it's like, did a van, did a band have a van? You know, you got to get them to record, you got to get them merch, they got to sell CDs. Um, you know, yep. they have to like not explode internally because that you're putting all this money and you're like, hey, are you guys getting along? Like, because that's that's <laughs> the core of it. That that explodes, all this fucking money I just poured into this is now completely gone. <laughs> but you know that's just my story other people are able to succeed better than i ever succeeded starting with way less 
those are always still issues though which is the band is like very emotional people or one one emotional person who's the fucking lead singer and you know yes. you're just like okay tippy toeing around them like okay we just want to make you happy oh yeah because the thing for the survival of the label is having the bands go forward mm-hmm. and you know in, in re-boosting lobster records i am actually though going to revisit the past and pull out some of the work that's already been done and try to re uh, promote that just to get it back into people's consciousness. Like re-releasing the old releases on vinyl. You know, I'm not sure what tact to take. I'll be calling people and consulting Hmm. and then try to decide, you know, what would be the best to do for, for folks. I love the fact that you personally called them up though, to ask them, that must've been like a trip for bands going, yo dude, it's like, the guy who owns Lobster Records just called us. Oh yeah, it was once, especially once we got going. I could tell, and uh, <laughs> you know, it was great. I always appreciated all that, you know, because it was a way of knowing that the hard work that we put in was actually respected. Well, it's also like you were very. It sounds like you were obviously very strategic with business, and I think like that's a power move to show like dedication to a potential working with someone yeah a- 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 absolutely and really you know it was uh it was fun for me i don't know what else to tell you mike it really was yeah i mean like yeah I, doing it or having anything about it i found the people that i got to deal with fascinating well again it's like i said before there's something about the new startups nowadays they're just putting out some product that's digital in, I'm sure in a geeky way, programming stuff has got to be nice. But like running a label, sure. I mean, like any business is stressful. Like me working for myself, it's st- it's stressful because it's like sometimes I don't know where the money is coming from. I'm sure there's a moment where p- things are flowing. But the fact that it, you, you're like, you can also have fun with it. That's a key ingredient that I think a lot of businesses probably don't realize. Like calling a band up and being like, this is fun. Like there, I get to own this label and call them and potentially they're going to oh, be excited. To yeah. Do and, and have the, and have the people, um, actually show up all the way from New Jersey here in California to make an album. It was so much fun. Everyone listening, Steve had to jump off the call in the last time we spoke. So there's a, that's why there's this break here, but we're going to continue where we left off. But, uh, right before we started, um, I had asked Steve about, the, what it was like in the office and uh, there was a couple people he wanted to talk about and um, so I figured I'd give him the floor and just kind of let him kind of just talk about who worked there and you know what uh, what they contributed and maybe like where they've uh, gone off to to today okay well just briefly uh, I wanted to make sure to mention uh, some people uh, that tr- contributed so tremendously along the way that nothing would have happened ever without them and uh hopefully chronologically uh jc curry of course whose brother was warren in yellow card and we never would have had yellow card come to lobster orbit without the talents and you know enthusiasm and ambition of uh jc so uh he was terrific to to work with uh john cox jeremy rich uh kevin wade uh, John is still working in the music industry. Kevin's in the entertainment industry. Jeremy's a financial advisor. You know, wouldn't have been able to do anything uh, without them. Matt Vigliotti, who came and uh, helped start Orton Records with me. And uh, Stacy Berman, who was uh, terrific, just helping out with publicity and promotion around the office. So we had a tremendous staff of people. How did you that, find all those people? You know, um... It was just a special time, and there they were. And we all kind of knew it about each other, that we should take advantage of the opportunity and strike while the iron was hot. It was just a tremendous group of friends, you know, one of those special special occasions where things kind of gel for a few years. Did you find that it was that moment where, as the label was growing, you obviously realized there was a certain things that you didn't know how to do and you needed someone to sit in that spot, and then you went like looking for them and that's how you stumbled upon everybody or did you or did like they happen to just like me to kind of manifest it and they just you got like a phone call and you're like i actually needed you someone like you to fill this spot (laughs) you know it was a little bit of both as things developed and i got busier and busier and needed the help i would uh put the word out at the local colleges and universities and ask through my network of friends around santa barbara and people would show up 
and they always seem to be the right person. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I've I've gotten really big, and I've talked about this many times in the podcast where I've worked for myself for a while, and I've read a lot of books about business, like a lot of books about business and success, and like the people who are really successful. And it's it is funny that they're when you start, you have this you have this idea in your head of the thing you want to do, and I think a lot of people don't start that because they're too focused on the how instead of they just go for it. And they're like, you know what? I just, I know this is going to happen. So I'm just going after it. And every, a lot of business, pretty much every business I've read about, they've started that way. And along the way, they just hit a wall. And that's the frustrating part. Cause they're like, oh my God, I don't know how to do finances or I don't know how to do this part yeah. of the business. Sure. And that's where, you know, some people nowadays it's, it's good because you could put that on Facebook or social media and say, Hey, I'm looking for this person. And it can get that get out there a lot quicker, but back then it was you told a friend or you told the a friend who was in that that realm of the person you needed, and they're like, oh yeah, this person the other day they just got fired from their job and just asked me to keep an eye out, and you're like, well, here I am. Right. And and we kind of knew each other a bit from going to concerts. You see, we 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 were all united by a mutual love of music. Well, that's of course, be pretty great. But, yeah, which is what drew everybody kind of together. Also, and we were the the people that weren't going to going to make the music, but just uh, be there to help the musicians. When you were you know? at when you're at the office with all these people, since you had such a love for music, did you find that during the workday you guys were just cranking music all day long? Um. Well, no. The office had a, you know, yeah, no. But the office had to be maintained in sort of an office environment. We were making phone calls all day long and having meetings with people and doing business things. So, you know, it wasn't like trying to conduct business over the over the sound of the music. But when the day was done, we would go out and go to shows all the time, support local bands and go down to Los Angeles to see whoever was coming through uh, Southern California. And that was always a terrific way to meet people also. Was there ever a moment where, a, 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 like as you had mentioned, demo tapes were coming through with the phone numbers on it, where... It would be, there was like one of the bands who you had signed, somehow someone just put it in. It was like, everyone shut up. You have to hear this. And then you were like, what's their number? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, many times. I think that happened with a small victory just in going through uh, demo records. If I remember right, they were one of the ones that just popped out from uh, the pile. Certainly Lorraine Drive just popped out from the pile. Uh, Ort bands, Anchors for Arms just popped out from the pile. That was something popped out from the pile. TGL popped out from the pile. Was there was there anyone that you were actually were going like they didn't pop out of the pile that you had heard of outside of receiving a demo tape and you were like, we have to go after them? Um, no, no, because the other uh, punk labels that were around at the same time that we were around were really good labels, too. Yeah. So people were always going to find help. One way or another, if they were any good. And one of the things we really liked to do was to really go through the demo tapes and try to find folks that were not from California, not necessarily associated with the scene, and try to, you know, bring them up from whatever point in America they originated at. So you specifically would try to find a band that wasn't located in California? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because those bands were going to be well taken care of. Uh, well regarded and well reviewed so what, you know, no what, problem for them what was the difference between why I, i'm kind of confused like wh what would be what made that stand out more than the california like how would they get better taken care of well they, you know you had the idea is that there are super talented musicians everywhere in our country yeah and i i just wanted to be open to you know bands that didn't necessarily come from southern california um, because it would help the label in one way too, by having more of a footprint all over the country. Oh, yeah. But it always, you know, helped me find the better bands because, you know, if you limit yourself to bands in Santa Barbara or bands just here or bands just there, eventually you run out of musicians because people have a lot of other things they can do and other companies they can go with. So you have to be open enough to have a wide enough, uh, you know, palette, a wide enough range to select a color from. Yeah, I actually, one of my questions was, um, if you ever had left, did you ever go out of state to go see these bands when they were on tour? Like the bands that you had signed? Um, yes and no. Not not as much as I would have liked to. I, of course, I've done it. But 
mainly I stayed in California and just kept the office together. Yeah, I'm thinking like for me, I, I mean, I'm 40 now, and I if I was doing some kind of business like that, I'd be like, yeah, I'll see you when you come into town. <laughs> it's like yeah, it was it was kind of like that, you know, because it's a little, you know, even then it was just uh, I wasn't into eating the Taco Bell anymore. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> Unlike yeah. when I was 19, and that's what I lived on. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I've talked to a bunch of people many times who have who've been in bands, and we'll talk about this if we would even have the well, if we would even want to go on tour nowadays. And I, I'm just like that just sounds awful. I I can't imagine. It's but I remember, tough. yeah, I remember like when when we were touring back then. Though I mean, there was all I wanted to do, and I can imagine people who are in their 30s or 40s or whatever looking at us thinking like damn man i don't know how the hell you guys are doing that and that's how i'm seeing bands now i'm just like i, I oh, yeah I, when you look back in your life how did you do that yeah well that's all <laughs> you, you know yeah i mean you didn't have that whole catalog right. of all this shit that i have now of knowing where it's just like all these little right. things you didn't have anxiety. enough stuff in your head to stop you from doing it exactly <laughs> yeah all i had was just this blank canvas of this sounds great like we're gonna go on tour and we're gonna get signed to this label or this this label and that's the way it's going to be. And then 20 years later, I'm like, yeah, it didn't really happen like that. But it was cool that we, I didn't know that. Cause that yeah, that's got me. great to find, you know, some new people to help out and kind of vicariously do it again. Yeah. So there was, uh, I'm trying to catch up because I, like I said, I had I'd edited pieces of the, or I edited the uh, first part of the podcast up till now. And we were talking about how much fun it was to run a label and how cool it was that you were calling bands up. Like they, you would call them directly. Like, did you try to, like, you know, like there is this aspect, you had this nice balance of you were very strategic. You were very smart with knowing to focus on, put a lot of money and attention on the artwork. So if people, if they did get signed, people would come back and they'd be like, Oh wow. Like we have to get this or this, this, there's, this is, this is catching my eye that I want to check this band out. Yes. But you also balanced it with the fun part. So like by calling up bands directly, like I like how you, you balance that where you were very focused. You weren't cranking music all day, but you were also calling bands. Like what, what other like fun things that you try to do to have, like keep that balance? Well, that was certainly fun. And then, you know, the people that were doing uh the websites, the promotional websites, the magazines were people that we actually knew. So it would be fun to call them and just talk to them also about what was going on in, in the larger world of, of our alternative music scene. And um, the people that ran all the production houses, uh, the published the magazines, and it was great to call them and just kind of chit chat and find out what was up for the day, the week, the month, you know? Yeah. You hear about other bands, hear about what other labels are up to and other artists. And then, of course, there was a lot of uh, interaction once we had a, a number of bands with the uh, tour support because people would need uh, calling, especially in the summer, uh, quite frequently, you know, to check in on the road, make sure everything was happening correctly, try to make sure the shows were coming off or going on. Yeah. What was like your because you were in California, you had hopeless, fat epitaph um who else asian man was asian man was more ska focused like who were in the santa barbara area like who were the labels that were that were there in santa barbara there was nothing really much happening other than the other kind of town label was the label that joey cape from Lagwagon started what was called that? my records my records yes i forgot about that yeah and uh you know they were here and gone did you guys, did you have an op open conversation with the other labels? Like, did you guys communicate like that? Or was it just, hey, we're, we are in competition? Oh, no, it, we, it wasn't like that at, at all. I mean, I never, nobody ever was in competition really with anybody else. It's hard enough. Yeah. It's a hard enough job. You know, you don't need to worry about killing people off. Was there any label though you had a friendly? That was Victory's job. <laughs> yeah, I've I've touched on that. I've talked to a few bands that were on Victory, and there was never like I, I always heard. You know, we don't have to talk about shit or anything like that. But I, I there was always like a stigma around that label. But a lot of people wanted to be on that label so bad. But it was basically like them, and I don't really. There wasn't a lot of labels where I heard a lot of bad shit about. 
And yeah. I remember like hearing about you guys because I heard about you because of Whippersnapper. And <sighs> yeah, and um, they were I, so good. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I actually reconnected with Andy Munn because of this interview. I reached out to him. I was like, hey, dude, I haven't talked to you in a while. What's up? Lovely. Tell me. Yeah, he's good. He um, he's living in North Carolina now, which is cool because he's only about two and a half hours south of me. And if I like driving, I would <laughs> easily drive down to Charlotte and get a beer with him. But I'm sure I'll yeah, venture down there. Yeah. yeah, but he's there. And he said, Pat, the drummer, he's still in Atlanta. I didn't really know where the other guys were. But yeah, we did a tour with them for, man, I don't know if it was like a week or two weeks, maybe. But that was, they were great guys. They were such yeah, absolutely. Nice Every one of them. I miss them, you know? That's all that there is to say. I miss them. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine just the relationships that you had created with these bands. Yeah. But the the one thing I said I was you were so focused on design. Uh, Whippersnapper had the ripoff of the ML of the Major League Baseball icon, but they had a guy jump in playing guitar. I think it might have been Jason from the band. No, it was Sean Dewey, actually, from Lagwagon, was the model for that poster. Really? Yeah, that cover. Tell me about how that came about. Well, we had a, a photo of Sean jumping up, and I cannot even tell you who was the photographer, but it was uh, it turned over to the artist that drew all the lobsters, and he styled it, outlined it. You know, I can't even tell you what he did, but he showed up one day with uh, the logo, the baseball logo, <laughs> done as a guitar player. It was terrific. So that was that wasn't like their idea. That was just the artist who came no, up. No, that, that was Brett, Brett Hammond came up with that. I'm pretty sure. That's so funny. Yeah, that was a, that stood out. I mean, that was another way that a lot of bands would just kind of. I mean, like even marketing now, it's you need to find some way to stand out, and that was something that totally stood out. Was just that because that's what bands back then we were ripping off. Major, yes. or like doing like it was part of the look. Yeah. Was. I always loved that. We we did a couple times where we had we had a, a Ranger New York Rangers rip off shirt, and we had an Oscar Mayer rip off. Sure, it was a way of saying what you really thought about the system and about corporate dominance, and you know we were going to do what we were going to do. Yeah, and also it was a great way to make it stand out. There was a way to connect with people too who didn't know your band, but there mm-hmm. was that automatic attachment to what you were ripping off, which made them, I think. People bought a lot of that merch because of that, even before knowing the band. Yes, I believe that would be probable. Yeah, but um, yeah, I just because I was looking through uh, Spotify because I always do, I always have like a bunch of tabs open or Spotify open when I'm doing these interviews, and I was like, oh, I forgot about that that sticker, but it's the album cover for America's Favorite Pastime, which is on Lobster Records, but then the Long Walk that wasn't on Lobster. No, that came out on Lobster, and then after the long walk, they uh, uh, shifted over to, uh, it was Top Ramen, wasn't it? Or Fuel by Ramen? Fuel by Ramen. What am I saying? Top Ramen. Did Fuel even... by Ramen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you, wait, so did they buy the releases? Because I read something about that, and I was like, oh, I didn't realize they were on Fuel by Ramen. But did when they went over to that, did they, Fuel by, Wam, Fuel by Ramen, buy the rights for... The Long Walk and America's Favorite Pastor? Uh, no, 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 no. They're still Lobster releases, and they're going to be uh, reboosted, I hope, when I get uh, the new website up. So how does that work now? When you have all of your bands that are on Spotify, because you can find them on Spotify, are you the one who yeah. hosts them? Or do they all have the catalog themselves? Or like they have their own tracks and they upload it themselves? Yeah, it. but when I... Uh, uh, backed off from really active involvement after I had lost uh, control of the label. A few of the bands put stuff up by themselves. Some of it has been put up by our, our distributors. Okay. And, you know, it's a it's a mixed thing. And uh, that's fine. It's, you know, sorted itself out and come to whatever level it's come to. But that still uh, doesn't mean we won't go ahead and try to re uh, promote and reboost things. Of course, I'd love to do that. Yeah, how's that work with the label coming back on now with well, all let's those releases? See. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we don't we don't quite know yet, Mike. That's gonna be part of the fun. You'll be you'll be calling me up in a year, maybe, hopefully. I mean, I would like to see a lot. I mean, I, I can imagine this stuff being put on vinyl since there's such a vinyl resurgence. Having just small press releases or just colored vinyl of these releases in short runs to create that 
that up. Right. Well, I still have uh, vinyls of America's favorite pastime and the long walk, for example, that need to be offered for sale online. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, like I'm sure I have 20 or 30 uh, America's Favorite Pastimes, 20 or 30 uh, long walks left, and I at least should put them up on the website because people will want them. Yeah, I remember in long walk or um, the recording process of long walk, they went to a cabin in the woods. Where like, did they? Did you, who? Do you remember who had come up with that idea, or if like you had any part in that? Oh well, uh, no, that was when they were uh, really out in Colorado with. Uh, you know, the descendants and Bill Stevenson. That was and it. yeah, that was a terrific, terrific time. I was so happy they did that. That was such a smart move and pick up on, on all of his experience and knowledge. And the, the recording came out great. Oh, oh yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. I remember when they came to Jersey, they had, they toured, I met them because they toured with humble beginnings, who was a band from Jersey. And, uh, the bass player from that band went off and started midtown. Do you remember that band? Yes, of course. Yeah, that was the one thing we heard. <laughs> they were like, yeah, we went to a cabin in the woods and we'd record during the day or we'd be fishing and we recorded and it was just super chill. I was like, man, that sounds fucking amazing. <laughs> it does. I like, I want to do that. And then I wish we, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, I'm just trying to just look through my list of things. Um, and I, I, I had asked a, a peop, some people a couple times if there's things they want to talk about. And a lot of people usually just say no, but like it sounds like when we were speaking last time, a lot of things popped into your mind that kind of came to the surface. Like, and I think I'd asked you about that, but I wanted to ask you again since we've had a, a couple days with, since it's you know uh, since we last spoke. Was there anything that popped up that was a memory or a story that you wanted to talk about? Well, no, nothing in particular that I really want to reveal right now. But what really uh, popped up in my mind was just a lot of memories of. Uh, being in the office with uh, the people, the guys and gals that were working with me. Do you still have any like con- connection with them, or you like reach out to them and just say, "Hey, what's up?" Oh yeah, every now and then, and certainly through Facebook, it's easy enough to keep track of folks. Yeah, a lot of people have gone on to do the family thing too. Yeah, it's funny. I, I've reconnected with so many because of this podcast. I've reconnected with people from back then, and they all have families now, and it's just wild seeing that. But the cool thing is that because I'm connecting with these interviews, Facebook will suggest these other people that were in bands back then that I looked up to. And so I'll just add a, fr- you know, I'll, I'll add them, I'll send a friend request and we'll connect or it'll open my mind to be like, oh, I should talk to them now. So it's just, that's just cool how Facebook in the positive sense of it can work really well other than all the crap that <laughs> it does on the opposite yeah. spectrum. Uh, what part of New Jersey are you in, Mike? Well, I, I'm living in North Carolina now, but I grew up in... Oh, that's right. You're in North Carolina. Yeah, so... but I grew up in uh, northern Jersey by... Um... Do you know Jersey pretty well? Well, I'm heading over there in April. Oh, nice. Yeah, if I was there, I would totally uh, say hello. But... Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm very far away now. I see. Yeah, I've had a... If I, it's it, the whole This whole podcast has been done... I've done this from North Carolina, which is so funny, because... The first 29 episodes, I was talking to everybody from New Jersey, and I felt, and then we, my old band played a show. Well, well, Mike, see, this is perfect. This is exactly what I mean. We had a North Carolina band on Ort Records called Dawn of the Dude. Dawn of the Dude. That's amazing. Dawn of the Dude, who made one terrific album for Ort Records. I want to go back and really re-promote, you know? Where were they located in North Carolina? Oh, my gosh. Now you're really taxing my brain yeah no, no. well north carolina is a lo- way bigger than new jersey so yes it's yeah this, but, this but yeah, yeah, yeah it was more in reference to the idea of just reaching out to people all over the united states yeah you know and finding talent in you know places that might be considered a little bit off the beaten track yeah absolutely yeah you would find especially like there's a lot of bands that were big and you're like where the hell is where the hell are you from and then that became kind of a hot spot for people touring there because that band brought such a focus it was, yeah. there was so many eyes on them that people would venture there and it kind of opened that up to being a place where a lot of great shows would happen because of that yeah absolutely but so before we we uh before i end this i tell talk about ort records for a little bit like how long was that around or are you still doing anything with that yeah, Wirt is still a, a viable uh, company. It still has uh, a dozen releases that came out on that label. And that was really my 
what I try to do, f- firstly, to heal from after losing control of lobster. Yeah. Was to be able to work through Ort. But at, you know, at that point, I had lost most of my money. So it was a little hard to sustain Ort and do things in the way that I was used to doing it. And that kind of, you know, took the pump out of me a little bit, too, because uh, survival became a bit of an issue. Uh, the, the, the struggle, you know, the personal struggle just became a little too much. And, I, I you know, I needed to step back and I felt that Ort wasn't uh, really actually putting enough resources into these bands, you know, in line of trying to respect the artists feeling that they might be better served, uh, you know, by hooking up with a, with a more advantageous situation. So I, I just kind of retired from working at it, but, uh, never lost the idea of doing something. And now that I'm capable of really doing things again, you know, I want to. How do you imagine doing this again, what your day to day will look like now? I mean, is, how much of your day is going to be put into this balance with what you're currently doing? Well, it'll be it'll be different because I'm going to start again with trying to find like a little help, you know, a real assistant that I could uh, have on staff and really help me build things up. So uh, my hands on day to day role will be a little more uh, maybe directorial than actually in it every day but I, I mean i will be doing stuff daily are you going to try to sign new bands or just stick with the old catalog and promote that we're going to start with the catalog yeah for sure for sure and because the landscape of bands have changed um i think i briefly touched on this last time like uh, we might take the tact of just finding you know a band with a, a good manager associated with them and trying to help out that manager to get the band going and it might not even be that the ultimate product comes out on Ord or lobster interesting we might just try to help the management level up there are a lot of ways to do these things nowadays you got to be loose you know in your thinking and light on your feet yeah i mean i could see uh just being a consultant to that would be a, like a way to go as well under the label yeah but it wouldn't be a consultant that people would pay me i'd be paying them <laughs> so I don't know what is that inverted consultant. Yeah, but I think that like, you have so much knowledge and things that you did. Where I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't want to charge for your time for certain labels out there. Ban- I don't know. I mean, I think there's gotta if you have that way of promotion and just the way that you set the label up. Sure, it was 20 years ago, but that stuff still will. I don't know. That'll translate now. I think with certain ways that you did it. Yeah, yeah, Mike. But usually, you know, when people are, are, are starting up again, they just have so few resources. And I would be much more interested in seeing them started than picking up a couple hundred dollars from talking to someone. I mean, yeah, I'll do that. For, for, I'll do that for free. That's awesome. No problem. I'm happy enough and flattered enough to be asked a question. Well, if anyone listening, uh, keep your eye out for Steve. And if you are yeah, a label or him. Mark, yeah, find him. Um, because if he's going to give up a, 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 what would be the word, a well of knowledge to help you grow your band or your label. I mean, I would jump on that as much oh, as you can. Sure, sure. And hopefully find some good people to work with. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Um, uh, so three more questions. You, Mike Doyle, you are on fire. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay, just before you go, um, I mean, <laughs> I always stupidly ask this after you've already promoted something so <laughs> Is there anything besides the, the reboot of Lobster Records that you want to promote, or do you just want to just have... Sh- oh, absolutely, Mike. The other thing, of course, is my book, Autumn 859. There we go. So that will be coming out at some point, and uh, it's a very spiritual story. You know, it's a journey that goes from from nothing to something. So do you have that? Is that actually out, or is it being published now? It, no, it's uh, in the phase of being edited but it's 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 completed. It's just getting looked over by other humans. And what was the name of again? Autumn what? Autumn eight five nine. Eight five nine. Okay, cool. Uh, last question. I asked this of everybody who's on the podcast. What scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day? You know, all of them. You know, live for the music, and never forget that musicians are human beings. <laughs>